I would like to welcome all those who will be viewing this video. My name is Wesley Norwood and I'm part of Joe Gilboy's PABoardReview.org team, which is True Evidence-Based Learning. If you haven't had an opportunity to view the Neurobiology of Learning and the Evidence-Based Learning video, it's posted on our Facebook and YouTube page. So this will be the first in a four-part series covering hematology. I would like to make these quick and to the point as time is a limiting factor for most of us. So let's go over the outline. So first, this lecture will start with the physiology and terms associated with hematology. I think it's important to understand the physiology and the pathophysiology will help us to answer questions and kind of help us sidestep trying to just memorize answers to memorize them. The second lecture will we will go over the extrinsic and intrinsic clotting cascade. So if we read over and over and over the extrinsic and intrinsic pathway and it's been really confusing I'm going to try to make it uh, to the point but also applicable to the disease processes, uh, autoimmunity, etc., etc. And then we'll look at some lab testing associated with hematology. Lecture three will go over the disease states, the pathophysiology, autoimmunity, uh, etc. We're going to try to focus on those things that are more uh, likely to be asked on the pants or pan ray. And then finally in lecture four, we're going to cover the leukemias. So hematology covers about three percent of the whole or the total of the exam for the pants or pan ray. That's about nine questions on the pants and seven questions on the pan ray. And you might be asking yourself, why are we spending so much time on this then? Well, I think it's important to understand uh, the physiology and how it affects other body systems. If you look at the role that the cells in hematology make up, they affect so many other things. And to get a better understanding of hematology will help you to better understand other processes. So, composition of blood. So if you take a beaker of blood, spin it down, 55% of that beaker will be plasma, and 45% would be formed elements. Now remember, serum is plasma minus the clotting factor. If you're to take plasma and stir it with a glass rod, the clotting factors would stick to that rod and you'd be left with serum. Red blood cells, the concentration, it's important to know, is 4 times 10 to 6 per microliter, which is, to put it into perspective, it takes about 50 drops of blood to make 1 milliliter. The lifespan is about 120 days. Remember, they're anucleated cells. They circulate through our bloodstream. They wear out. They eventually fall apart and are recycled by the spleen. When there is a decrease in oxygen detected by the kidneys, erythropoietin is released, and red blood cells are formed in the bone marrow. In adults, it's flat bones like the sternum, the ribs. In pediatrics, it's all bones long bones. White blood cells, lifespan is hours to days. Remember there's two types there, granulocytes and agranulocytes. Granulocytes have vesicles in them containing enzymes or other chemicals. The agranulocytes are those cells minus the vesicles. And if you remember, the concentration is about 5,000 to 7,000 cubic millimeters. You have neutrophils, which are the most numerous. They're the phagocytic cells. Basophils can contain vesicles with histamines. They cause inflammation just like mast cells. Eosinophils are associated with allergy and parasitic infections. The monocytes are circulating in the bloodstreams until they eventually will migrate to tissue as phagocytes. And the lymphocytes are immune cells. Then we have thrombocytes, which are platelets. They're Lifespan is about four days, so you have to imagine that our, they have to be replenished quite frequently. The concentration is 250,000 per cubic milliliter. So as you're thinking about these different components, you have to ask yourself, well, what kind of 
disease processes or pathophysiology can affect these. And we'll go into that in more detail, but you should be asking yourself these questions. For example, DIC, which is disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, is where the platelets and clotting factors cause embolisms throughout the whole system, but they eventually get used up, so then you're left with severe bleeding because your body can't stay in balance. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Next, um, how does the body maintain you know, homeostasis? So first, if we look at the liver, the liver does a lot of things. As Joe said, it really kind of runs a show. It provides the inactivated coagulation factors. We'll talk about that. Um, B12, folic acid, calcium, vitamin K. Remember, anything that's absorbed by the and GI tract usually goes through the liver. We have the red blood cells. Platelets are circulating. They're in their inactivated form. We have prothrombin and fibrinogen, which are the common um, components of the extrinsic and intrinsic pathway. We'll talk about that. They're all um, inactivated. And then if we look at the vasculature in general, remember we have an intuba portion of the vasculature that has a one simple squamous epithelial cell layer thick. It's called endothelium when we talk about it inside the vasculature. They're pancake shape. They're edge to edge. They're very um, close together, but they're very thin. Underneath that, we have connective tissue that glues that layer to the, the next um, layer, which is the media layer. Depending on where you are in the vasculature, remember, you can have smooth muscle, you can have different types of elastic tissue, you can have connective tissue, depending on if you're in the muscles, they have more smooth muscle to uh, regulate the flow to the muscles. If you're talking about the main arteries, they have more elastic tissue, not a lot of um, smooth muscle or muscle because they use the energy of the heart to propel the uh, flow of blood in between heartbeats. And then if you look at vasculature, that's going to the arterioles or the venules and the capillaries, they have different amounts of these tissues in there. But it's important to understand the structure. Each day our body deals with thousands of microthrombi each day, little blood clots that can happen just from daily activity, exercising, you know, eating Cheetos. Imagine eating a rough Cheeto and it going down your esophagus, falling, playing. Um, how, do, how does our body take care of these things? without compromising other areas of the vascular system. So if you remember, we talked about the endothelial lining. It consists of a single layer of epithelial cell or endothelium. They're flat, round, smooth. Think of them as kind of like a pancake. Uh, they're very resistant to friction. If you're able to shrink yourself down and look at them, it's, uh, it would look shiny. It would be like Teflon, very resi resistant to friction. But they're also biologically active. They produce products that keep platelets inactivated and coagulation in check. I don't want to get into the memorizing these fine little details, but it's important to know that they do exist and we're consistently uh, producing these to keep our um, coagulation in check. So like our cells, they produce nitric oxide, uh, prostaglandins, um, ADP, which are specialized enzymes to inactivate blood factors. We have uh, plasmin, which breaks down fibrins. We have thrombomodulators, which is thrombin, and protein C, which sits at the top of that, which inactivate factors um, 5 and 8. And if you hear about um, the heparin sulfate, if that sounds familiar, it, it, we use heparin. It breaks down uh, thrombin molecules. Then you think about blood flow. Blood flow allows these molecules to have less of a chance to bump into each other, to activate, to come in contact. So that's when you know, we start running into problems when somebody has decreased blood flow. When they have trauma and decreased blood flow, it allows these molecules that are for coagulation to interact. So blood flow helps with that. The purpose of the vascular system is to transport nutrients to tissue and remove metabolic waste. We talked about the red blood cells. Now, uh, we've talked about, you know, talked about red blood cells and blood transporting these nutrients. And I like to think of, you know, 
the analogy of a train. Joe uses the analogy of a train. I think, like to think the red blood cells kind of as a train wheels. And then in order for red blood cells and certain cells to have the right structure, you need to have enough vitamin B12 and folic acid. Remember when a fetus is developing, folic acid is very important uh, for the nutritional uh, requirements of dividing cells and for them to function properly. And then when you think of hemoglobin, um, they determine how much carrying capacity you have in the red blood cells. And if you look at um, this picture I have, I think of the red blood cells as the train wheels, vitamin B12 and the folic acid kind of as the uh, structure that holds the train cars together and how much hemoglobin determines how big of a load that your train can carry for the partial pressure of oxygen and gases. And then we also have to think about the compensatory mechanisms such as the heart. You know, how fast are those trains moving? Your cardiac output, the stroke volume times the stroke rate. You also have to think about how do these nutrients get into your body. For example, intrinsic factor is produced by cells in your stomach which allow you to uh, you to absorb vitamin B12. You have to follow the problem back to the origin. Are they not eating enough of it or are they not being able to absorb that? And we'll talk about that. And then, you know, nutrients, folic acid, liver function factors. If your liver isn't functioning correctly, it's not going to be able to build those clotting factors. You think about alcoholics or hepatitis, kidneys and EPO. How much volume is getting to the kidneys? You got to think about your, your bone marrow, you know, it, erythrogenesis. Um, Are there uh, mature or immature blood cells being generated? And then the spleen. In its full-time job, it's a big lymph node, but it also recycles red blood cells. And then the movement of, you know, the blood in the bloodstream. So I like to think about um, kind of breaking it down into a picture that I can kind of think of in my mind. In lecture two, we're going to go over the extrinsic and intrinsic pathway of blood clotting. I'm kind of excited for that. That's always been a kind of a mystery for a lot of people. And then um, the lab test associated with it. And then we'll get into the different uh, diseases that you're going to see on the pants and pan ray. And then we'll go into leukemias. I'd like to um, thank Joe for his expertise and his knowledge and the amount of time and effort he puts into this. Um, my name is Wesley Norwood. I'm a physician assistant. If you have any comments, questions, please um, shoot me an email. We're very responsive and I'll look forward to hearing from you.